Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe, and this is the Expat Money Show. Today's guest is the co-founder of the Polyglot Gathering, co-founder of Duolingo's Esperanto course, and founder of Esperanto Wikipedia, among other Esperanto and Polyglot projects. He had the idea for a GPS device to find fellow Esperanto speakers while traveling through Brazil in 2002, but he needed to wait 15 years for the technology to catch up so he could pursue this dream. Now he looks forward to meeting the challenges ahead to help people everywhere connect and make the world a better place. Please welcome to the show, Chuck Smith. Chuck, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me on the show. My pleasure. I'm really excited about this one. You know, I have been kind of hearing the word Esperanto for probably 15 or 20 years now and kind of every year or two go and look up and read a couple articles about it. So I know kind of what Esperanto is, but I guess maybe we should start with, you know, how did you find Esperanto? You know, why is it interesting to you? And maybe just a quick background of, of really what it is. And then we're going to get into some detail in today's conversation. So I was taking a university class called uh, Models of Mind. So just a background, a computer science degree. And uh, this was an artificial intelligence class. And I wrote a paper on how um, computers could learn languages. And at the time I came across Esperanto and I was like, well, this is a stupid idea for people, but for computers, it would make sense. It'd be great for computers to learn a language because it's much more regular than um, the normal national languages, for example. And so then I um, was actually talking to the professor about this later, and he was like, oh, I wish you'd talk more about Esperanto in the, um, in the speech I gave about the paper afterwards. And I was like, okay, interesting. And then I um, did a little bit more research out of curiosity and found, uh, I found one thing called the Passport de Servo, which is a network of Esperanto speakers. It's sort of like couch surfing before couch surfing. I mean, this started in the 60s, if you can imagine that as a book. I just um, sent to Esperanto speakers around the world where you could stay for free. And I was like, huh, I really wanna do a three month trip in Europe. So if I do this, I could stretch my budget more. So I'm one of the, I guess you could say I'm one of the few people who actually learned Esperanto for practical reasons. <laughs> and, um, and I also, well, it's also the ideal of it that I like the, um, idea that uh, if I'm say I'm in France and I'm I'm sort of like the idea that I give the um, the French person the option which international language he wants to speak do we want to speak uh, English or do you want to speak Esperanto with me so in a way it's a, also a way of um, being fair okay so let's dig into like what exactly is Esperanto because I'm going to make a guess that probably a lot of my listeners don't have a lot of experience with Esperanto. So I want to be really clear at the very, very beginning. And then I want to get into kind of some of the history and things like that afterwards. Yeah. So an eye doctor in uh, Warsaw published uh, um, the, the initial rules of Esperanto in 1887. And at the time, it was just a thousand words and 16 grammar rules. And from there, it um, just expanded naturally as people spoke it and um, just grew naturally. It's, it still amazes me that that's such a simple beginning, and yet you can have dictionaries today that are you know, very thick, <laughs> thousands of, um, over a thousand pages at least. Um, and the idea basically is that, uh, so uh, you wanna cut the language down to the most uh, logical levels possible, remove the, um, you don't have the 500 irregular verbs book of Esperanto because there are no irregular verbs. That um, Oh, and there's also a nice affix system. So there's prefixes and suffixes that you can just attach to words. So the uh, example I like to give is you have the word for sana, which means healthy. And then you can make malsana, which means unhealthy. And then you can make malsanulo, which is an unhealthy person. And then malsanuleyo, unhealthy person place, which is a hospital. So it's sort of um, in a way, well, it's a way for people who don't have a common language to Esperanto, like say you're from Asia and you don't have a, you don't speak English or French or Spanish or anything like that. Um, you can also just piece together words as you need them. And uh, it's just a great way to be, just communicate. And basically the idea with that is if a word makes sense put together like that, then it's, um, it's logic, it's valid. I think it's just beautiful. Okay. So this is a constructed language. It's not one that had its roots in Latin or something else. It's really completely from scratch. Is that correct? Right. So it was a guy in Warsaw that basically saw there were languages all around him and people couldn't speak to each other. And his initial goal was for world peace. But I think it's, um, 
which is a very lofty goal, of course. But I think today it's more thought of as um, a way for people to like have their own international community. And also like, benefits, for example, like if I go to Japan, like if I'm speaking English, then probably the person you know wants to sell me something. That's probably the situation you're in. If there's some kind of business arrangement, whereas I think with Esperanto, it's more like um, people want to make friends. It's more of the idea behind it. Of course, there are business deals happen in Esperanto as well. And, Things like that, but I, it's that the focus is um, you're not expecting. Um, yeah, I think you get what I mean. It's very much more of a friendly thing. You don't people don't learn Esperanto to make money; you know, they're learning it to make friends around the world. Okay, well, and I would also imagine that it puts people on a more a much more even keel. And I and I can think of my own life as an example. You know. I'm Canadian. My first language is English, but my wife is from mainland China. Her first language is Mandarin. She mm -hmm. has amazing English, but I still have to speak to her as someone who speaks English as a second language. So there's always going to be some type of an imbalance there. Now, we've been together for so many years that I don't really think about it now, you know, and her English has improved mm -hmm. so much over the last seven or so years that it's okay. But I, I can kind of think that in a lot of instances, if you're forcing someone else to speak English, then you're forcing them to be at your level. And if you're at a native, then that's kind of, I mean, I, I don't like mm -hmm. using the word unfair, but I mean, there, there's some kind of um, challenge there. And I can give you no, one that's other- that's really true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can think of one other thing, and this is something that I talk about all the time. I live in Latin America, and I- actively study Spanish because I don't want everyone to always have to interact with me on my terms. I would rather be, mm -hmm. when I'm a guest in someone else's country, try to go on their language and speak to them on their terms, which makes sense for someone like an expat who's living in Panama. But if you're traveling through Europe and every few hundred kilometers, there's a different language, that can be probably a lot to keep up with, I would imagine. Yeah, and for example, uh, a lot of people say that you you don't sound as smart in a foreign language, especially if you don't know it that well. So I've had experiences too speaking with, um, like, let's say a German friend here, and uh, so I'm in Berlin right now, and um, so I just talked to my German friend. Like, I mean, we'd actually never spoken anything else except Esperanto, and then one day he was like, "We just speak English just for fun, you know? Why not?" And I was like, "Okay, sure." And it's just this psychologically, he just didn't sound as intelligent and i'm just like this <laughs> this isn't right for me to think this way it's just this is what just i hope he listens to this happen. episode <laughs> <laughs> i have to send them hey tell <laughs> probably get a kick out of that <laughs> so okay the other thing that really comes to mind when we talk about this is politics because Mm -hmm. with all languages there's some type of inbuilt politics First of all, does Esperanto have any politics attached to it? Is it a is it a nation state type of language? Did it come? I know that you said it originally came mm. from Poland, but does it have like its ties to a geographical location like Poland, or or is it completely world open, uh, worldwide? It's completely worldwide. Obviously, some countries speak it more than others, um, and uh, like most Esperanto organizations, will even in their like mission statement. To, declare that they're neutral politically. Um, well, some say neutral politically, except for in the case of language rights. Um, but I um, would say generally the Esperanto community does skew left. Okay. I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> but we're also very accepting of everyone. So. Okay. All right. Um, I, I would always say, how, how do I always put it? Um, Economically, I'm extremely far right, and socially, I'm extremely far left. Uh, I'm libertarian, mm -hmm. so I just want to be left alone and be peaceful <laughs> and don't take my money. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm completely off the access, I would say. I, I asked the question about politics, not because of the difference between left and right, but more of the difference mm -hmm. between, you know, if you are speaking English, then that comes with, you know, if we look at the origins of where English came from, I, I understand that it's mm -hmm. a, um, a mix mash of, you know, Latin and Germanic and Old English and, and multiple languages. But if we really mm -hmm. think about, you know, England and Great Britain and what that meant for the rest of the world um, over history and understanding that, you know, there's certain directions where it's, it's so very different 
when you go through Asia or through Africa or through Latin America, mm -hmm. these types of things. So it's kind of interesting, a language that was started from scratch that didn't start from a nation state. Right. And I mean, I think that's also an interesting point to make. For example, I remember making friends in Brazil and Poland and Japan, and um, I'm realizing they never really, if, if they learned English in school, they never really like took it to heart. And so you can actually have this conversation where you're speaking to people who have um, like no like general feel of say UK and US um, culture. Whereas if you're talking to someone in English from abroad, they generally have studied quite a lot about uh, when is tea time in the UK and when is, how do you go to the mall in America and things like that. Of course, pretty much everyone has seen American movies. I mean, you still have that, but. Um, yeah, but the biggest export from the United States is culture. <laughs> I mean, movies yeah. are absolutely <laughs> huge anywhere and everywhere you go on planet Earth. People have watched the latest Marvel movie or they know the Star <laughs> Wars or anything like that. Right. Like even some of the, um, the biggest box office hits are in mainland China. And so they have to be really careful about those types of things. Okay, back on to mm -hmm. Esperanto. So mm -hmm. you kind of touched on it before. But maybe you can highlight it a little bit more. Like, why do you think that Esperanto is is so important? Well, I think it's so important just to help people communicate across boundaries. Um, just, I think, more communication we have among mankind, the better. And it's uh, almost a subversive way to communicate, you know, without any government influence or anything. Um, um, I mean, just just this general knowledge. I mean, just seeing. I mean, you can even see in some Wikipedia articles, if you look like language by language, you see they actually have different, they're saying different things in different languages. And it's like, okay, that's just, but there's like probably only one fact here. And it's, it would be better for people to be able to talk to each other more. And I think it does lead to more things like closer to world peace. Maybe not that lofty of an ideal, but uh, getting closer to there. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we discuss so much on the show is community. You know, we're really focused mm -hmm. these days on community. And with everything that's happening in the world, I really find that, you know, there's a lot of violence. There's a lot of, you know, um, separation between the parties and different viewpoints. I'm not an idealist by any means. I'm a pragmatist and I'm very realistic, but I think a realistic option is finding a safe new place that we can live. And then you start thinking about that, well, what would that look like? You know, I mean, as a libertarian, you know, I'm not going to tell people what they can speak and what they can't speak on the ground mm -hmm. in a community or a constructed city or anything like that. But it would be interesting to see if Esperanto did get picked up, if that was like a common ground, a thread, how people interacted with, the, with each other. So this is- and there have been some, there have been some territories over the years that have um, had Esperanto as the their, um, language, like Morrisnet. There was also some island off of Italy, and I think then uh, wow. Italy just went and invaded it. And then, oh, that was Rose Island, Island or something, wasn't it? Right, I saw, yeah. the, I saw the documentary. A, a net, or the, oh, yeah. Hey. I, want to, I want to see that on Netflix. I saw that. <laughs> yeah. I, a documentary is probably it, yeah. not the right word for it. The, the dramatization. <laughs> okay. Drama. But yeah. I mean, for, for what it um, is, I enjoyed it. It was, it was pretty fun. But uh, one thing that's interesting is every year they do have um, what's almost like an Esperanto city is uh, there's the um, Universal Congress of Esperanto, which draws between one and 5,000 people every year. This year will be in Montreal in um, August. So, um, but uh, every year it just moves from place to place. And it's almost like when you're there, you, you're in an Esperanto town. And it's uh, pretty fascinating, just like run into Esperanto speakers everywhere. And even when you're in the city, because you, I mean, you imagine that few thousand people into any city, you, you'll just end up randomly running into Esperanto speakers. So funny phenomenon. Very much so. So that way, yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So talk to me then, like how many speakers in the world or, or, you know, estimates of how many speakers in the world of Esperanto are there? So according to the World Almanac, it said uh, two million. But I tend to think yeah. it would be closer to, tend to think it's closer to a million. Okay. Of course, the question also would then be, what's an Esperanto speaker? Like what level? I mean, how would you say what's a chess player? That's for example, what level do you have to be? And um, and the question too of that million, I would say they're not active. It's like they could have learned it and then um, never used it, but it could be dormant. Because I've had people write me and um, like they've they've emailed me and they said, oh, I haven't 
used Esperanto in five years, please excuse my mistakes. And I see like, I saw like three mistakes in your email. Like <laughs> was a, the funny thing with languages is that you forget the irregularities. That's really what um, goes. And with Esperanto being so regular, it stays in your head over time. Okay. So, interesting. Very interesting. And, the, and one other thing I like about Esperanto is that um, it's a really big help to learning another language, especially if for um, say mono, the monoglot English speakers listening. Uh, because a lot of times it's that first language that's a real hurdle. Like some people say it's like learning the recorder, that um, the small flute in, uh, in music class. No one learns that to play that flute. Well, maybe a few people do, but that's typically not the goal. The goal is that you want to learn the saxophone. And by learning the recorder and music theory, you build yourself up to it. And so most people could learn Esperanto in like one or two years with like regular usage or regular learning. Um, and I mean, that's even one of the arguments. It's like, if we just spent two years teaching every kid in the world Esperanto, the whole world could talk to each other. And it's, just like, it's such a simple thing, but it's a whole Cat 22 situation. Who starts? Is it Germany starting? Is the United States starting? And if no one starts, then, you know, you, you, can't, you can't boil the ocean, basically, is the problem. Sure. Um, but then I guess that also ties back to our conversation about having it a non-nation state type of language. So if you make it enforced at the educational level in public mm -hmm. schools, then that's going to probably change a lot of the dynamic. It's kind of nice that people are coming to this of their own voluntary means mm -hmm. because they're excited about it. And it's something that they want to do instead of being enforced on them. Exactly. So with the two possibly 1 million people that speak Esperanto. Can you think of any other countries in the world or languages in the world that have roughly that amount of speakers to kind of give us context of what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. So Slovenian is about 2 million speakers. It's a small country in Europe. And um, it's, and isn't Denmark a million or so? I'm trying to remember. It's we were chit-chatting about Denmark before. <laughs> I, I was admitting that my family is originally from Denmark, but I've never been to Denmark and I do not speak Danish. So shame on me. Yeah. So it was interesting. Um, also another interesting language comparison when we were just making the Esperanto Duolingo back in the day. Um, a bit, like a few days before, after um, the Ukrainian course for English launched. I mean, this is way before the war when there's much less interest in the language. And... Um, we we're surprised at the time to find there are about as many people who are signing up for the Esperanto course as they were for the Ukrainian course. That can also give a feel. I mean, pre-war, how much interest there would be would be about the same for Esperanto and Ukrainian among English speakers. Okay, interesting. So what are some of the other reasons that, I, I mean, okay, Esperanto is the most popular of the constructed languages out there in the world. And it's not the only one. I, I actually did a bit of reading beforehand. There's actually quite a few out there, but it's certainly mm -hmm. the at the forefront. What are some of the other reasons that you think maybe it's not gone from 2 million to 20 million to 200 million? Like, what do you think the, mm -hmm. the stumbling blocks are there? Oh, that's a long, that's a long one. <laughs> we have more than an hour now? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so I think one thing is just um, it's sort of it's it doesn't have a great of a reputation. So I think it's, it's improving. Um, but also one thing that's been interesting is it's always grown except for during the world, world wars. So it's always been a growing language. Um, I think one issue is that um, at least today in 2022, people would consider English to be the, the international language and the people who've learned English want, would like to keep it that way because they spent the effort to learn English and then they also have power and politics and such to so there's no really incentive to them to promote Esperanto because then they're like oh I need to learn one more language now even though it's a lot easier than English but that's that's a lot of the problem is you just have this built up um, I mean the people in power don't have interest in making Esperanto the international language basically um, I mean and the funny thing is, though, I sometimes compare it with the, the fall of the um, Berlin Wall, because uh, it's like, if you ask people a month before the Berlin Wall fell, they'd say, uh, there's no way that would have happened that, um, um, yeah, that the Berlin Wall could fall, like, anytime soon. Because you still people making escape attempts and such the other side. And, um, 
And it's also like, it could just be one big event where suddenly there's a huge pop song that talks about Esperanto and then suddenly it's on the minds of a lot of people. I mean, Duolingo was a huge event for the Esperanto community. It brought in, well, millions of people at least heard about it. If, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Even if they did it just a couple of lessons, at least they heard about it and it, uh, grew tremendously from that. And, well, we found um, a lot of people was hearing from people like, hey, in our Esperanto club, someone came in, they never spoke a word of Esperanto before, but they were speaking almost fluently, <laughs> just showing <laughs> up from work, from doing Duolingo. Really, it was crazy. <laughs> wow. So, well, I personally say, um, if you want to learn a language, one thing I always say is um, always learn from, um, I, I personally choose always three sources. It's like, gives me enough variety to um, change, like choose a one and not too much variety that gets stuck. Like, uh, which which method do I want to use to learn this language, or which resource do I want to use? So, a little language learning tip there you can throw in on the side. <laughs> so, okay, so what are the three ways that you always like to learn languages then? Because I I'm assuming oh. that Esperanto is not your only secondary language that you've picked up. No, no. So I speak uh, well. I guess seven languages. So wow. If you can count Polish, Polish is the language I keep learning and forgetting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it's no, nothing in particular. Well, one thing. Um, it also depends on your goal in a language. For example, if you, um, I always tell people, if you really want to just go to a country and speak, like from day one, um, I recommend the Pemsler method. It's basically an audio course. It's actually from the 60s. It's crazy that it's still around and working. And I mean, a lot of the methodology is old, but um, it works. So um, it's a, it's basically like a whole, like you you bump into someone on the bus, what you say, it's really building reflexes. And um, I think it gives you a good foundation for speaking, particularly. But if you want to, um, let's say, really learn um, to watch a movie series, then I recommend uh, like put subtitles and flashcards and Mm-hmm. and really focus on like learning yeah it's just it, if you want to learn to read then yeah read a lot and maybe a listening reading method is better where you're um, like take a parallel text and also the audiobook from the language and mm-hmm. just really try to absorb it that way because it really depends on is is your key do you want to read that language do you want to speak in the country when you arrive like just order a beer a wine or something or or is it that you really want to dig into a movie series like really think think goal oriented like what do you really want to do with the language it's kind of funny with esperanto because people would typically say that's one of the le- the use- most useless languages you can, <laughs> uh, learn although i'd say for me personally it was probably the most enriching language and it's also funny for me that i've now lived um, over 15 years in germany and i still speak esperanto better than i speak german wow amazing yeah. <laughs> yeah so does that and speak it, to the power of your esperanto or the weakness in your german though <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think it speaks a lot to the um the, the the regularity of esperanto like i said that you really can you get up and running so fast like you could be learning it in the first week you're making a joke in esperanto which you could never do in mm-hmm. <laughs> most other foreign languages um yeah i mean it's also the fact that i live in berlin where um I moved here. There was a lot more German than there is now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you, now you go and, uh, well, you know, the experience as an expat, I'm sure you go to an event and uh, there's one person who doesn't speak well where you are Spanish and then everyone has to speak English all of a sudden. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, and that um, happens more and more in Berlin, with international events. Okay. And so then I found over time speaking more and more English. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was really trying to pick up uh, Spanish, I mm-hmm. spent hundreds of hours on italki do they have italki Mm. esperanto tutors yes they do awesome (laughs) no even know a couple personally (laughs) okay because i I, for me personally this was a fantastic way to learn the language just Mm chit-chatting about everyday things um you know with a tutor not a professional teacher they never taught me anything we just shot the shit and just Chit chatted mm-hmm. and talked about our kids and family and et cetera, et cetera. And I was able to pick up Spanish quite well. Um, you know, really taking it to the next level, I suppose. Yeah, excellent. I mean, uh, that's also one of the ideas behind our app, Amikumo, is to uh, meet people nearby who speak well, any language you want. But it started with the Esperanto community, and that's where it's strongest. So I always tell people if you like, say you learned, I mean, it was inspired partly by the Esperanto community on Duolingo. We're seeing people learning basically Esperanto in a bubble. And we're just like, there's likely someone in your own city who maybe is also learning on Duolingo or maybe has spoken it for 15 years already. And so we made Amikumo so that people could um, 
just open up an app and say, oh, there's an Esperanto speaker 500 meters away. Do you want to meet for coffee and chat, hang out? <laughs> cool. So have you had um, some pretty neat uh, experiences with that then, bumping into people? Yeah, it's been very interesting. And uh, or in, I think my my most, well, I was going to say profitable, but <laughs> that's the money show after all. So I <laughs> can go Absolutely. that route. Um, once I was invited to um, uh, Duolingo Pittsburgh, and um, and then I had to also leave after the meeting, um, or basically landed, went to visit my parents, and then went back. And uh, and I was like, you know, I don't really want to get a hotel. I, and I, I looked at the my app, and I actually found some um, people in um, Pittsburgh in the app. And I said, "Hey, could I crash at your place for like a night?" And I'm like, "Great, that was cool." <laughs> so it was actually really um, fascinating time. It was funny because they ended up being gamers, and so we ended up gaming all night. <laughs> yeah, quite Too fascinating. Funny. So, all right. So maybe explain a little bit about the language itself, how it functions. You know if someone wanted to start out, what that might look like. Yeah, so I definitely recommend something like um, Duolingo or Drops or Lerno.net. Uh, I don't know if you want to put links in the description under the video or the definitely. podcast. Yeah. To use to YouTube. <laughs> um, well, it's also on YouTube, right? We're now putting all of the interviews out on YouTube. The majority of our people, like 99% of the popu uh, population who listen to this, will listen to it on the podcast, so on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts and stuff. But we're now putting the video out. But either way, I will make sure that I put links um, in the show notes at expatmoneyshow.com. So I'll help you out and ask them to like and subscribe. There you go. <laughs> what do, what do they right. always say in the YouTube videos? Mash that like button. Mash <laughs> yeah, the like button. Exactly. What does that even mean? Oh my God. Just take your mouse and click here. Like... All of our podcast listeners are like, what are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so um, I don't know if you wanted more about how to get started learning Esperanto or like more about just like some basics of the language or what Both. are you looking more for? Both. Both. Okay. Yeah, so I gave some link, some ideas there. I can also give you after the show, Rachel, um, some uh, links at least to get started. Um, but uh, like one thing I found fascinating is the verbs. For example, if you have like say uh, you have the word uh, amis to to love, then amas is um, loves, amos is will love, amis is loved, and the great thing is that works for every verb across the entire language. So um, you just yeah, it's just amazing that way. And um, so that's interesting because in mm -hmm. Spanish it's amor, so it almost sounds mm -hmm. similar. And your earlier example where you said something about bad was like mal, which is also <laughs> yeah. bad in um, in Spanish or in Latin, you know, context. So are you sure it doesn't have any roots to Latin, or am I just imagining things where they don't exist? Yeah. So mal in Esperanto actually means un. Oh, but, okay. Uh, it means un. I think that, but. Uh, but it works in Malbona, which means ungood, funnily enough, for the Orwell. I mean, I believe the um, that was Orwell, right? Yeah, that, um, he um, actually had an Esperanto-speaking roommate. I'm not sure of this. I'm pretty sure of this one. <laughs> and that inspired a lot of things in his book, actually, because uh, he wasn't such a big fan of it. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, the vocabulary-wise, Esperanto is about 60% uh, Romance language, 30% Germanic, and 10% Slavic. Okay. So, but I was surprised when I was say, studying Polish, it felt like the um, the structure felt very similar. Like the way you do nuance with the word order is it felt more with uh, like the similar to the way Polish works and um, other Slavic languages from what I've seen. Okay. And then if someone wanted to get started, like, you know, really break it down, like say you were going to sit down with someone and you were going to say they wanted to learn Esperanto, what would your advice to them be? Hmm. Oh, I'd say find a, like see if you're if you're a book person, grab a book like Teach Yourself Esperanto. That's really great. If you're more of an internet person or you want a game like, then I'd say then like Duolingo or Drops or um, UTalk. Um, if you really want that kind of tutor experience, Italki. I mean, it's a lot of the same things you do for any other language. It's just I mean, there's obviously less resource. Well, I'd say less resources available, but it really depends on the language. I think you. Um, yeah, like if you're wanting to learn Slovenian, then it's about the same amount of resources available to you. But I think the difference though is that um, when you're learning Esperanto, the community is really um, a lot more helpful and a lot more welcoming. 
because it's not like you're an outsider coming to the country. It's like you're just becoming part of the community because they also had a time, I mean, except for say the one to 2000 native Esperanto speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, they also had a time where they learned Esperanto from scratch. So they know that the feeling of learning Esperanto and hopefully are more understanding of that way as well. Yeah, talk to me a little bit more about the community as well, because I think that mm -hmm. this is super fascinating. Now you mentioned earlier um, an annual gathering but maybe mm -hmm. break either break that down for me more or talk about other types of aspects of the community. Yeah. So like I said, there's many gatherings around the world. Um, the Universal Congress is always mentioned because it's the largest, but um, there's also a lot of Esperanto speakers who just say that like, that's too big for me. I don't want to get lost in a sea of thousands of people. Uh, there's also smaller, um, also like there's youth oriented events for, and youth in Esperanto is amusingly up to 35. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, um, so I don't think you're too old if you're 33 listening to this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, well, even so, um, some people even go a bit older if they're more young at heart to um, youth events. Um, that's usually more like youth hostel type situations and things like that. Um, but really, there's something just fascinating about going to any kind of international event where, um, um, well, for example, last year I organized a New Year's event. Well, because the um, because of COVID, the big New Year's Esperanto event was canceled. Um, that's also an amusing wordplay because it's called Yes, the Unilada Esperanto Semino. And the Yes is with a J in Esperanto. We pronounce like it what, why, like in German, but I digress here. But uh, we, we decided to call ours Ne to be funny to be no because <laughs> yes was canceled um which and we called that the no yada esperanto ludado uh, new year's esperanto gaming and we had um 10 people there from eight different countries which is just a great atmosphere that you've got 10 people there from eight countries and you're all speak no one's speaking their native language mm -hmm. No, just and everyone's on their own level playing field. Obviously, some people learned Esperanto more than others, but it's not the language itself wasn't the barrier mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to communication. Okay. But I think just so much of the magic comes from just having people from so many different countries and not feeling like there's one that's a dominant language. Because if you go to many international conferences, um, you'll find that tables tend to congregate around like there's the Spanish speakers over there, and there's the Italians over in that table. And Esperanto just blows that out of the water. You don't see that at all. <laughs> That's neat. That's very neat. And when people come to these types of events, do you have all levels or do people usually have like a certain fluidity in the language before they would ever step foot at one of these events? So I think it really depends on the style of event. So if you take the Universal Congreso, then you typically get the high level speakers. And I would even say only attend if you're at least intermediate. And I would even wait until you're completely fluent before going there because it's it's intense like it's eight parallel tracks and it's just yeah just plan to be exhausted afterwards <laughs> <laughs> but i mean if you take the youth meetings they're much more like laid back i mean there's also family meetings people who used to go to youth meetings and they, they had kids and they want to take their kids and let them experience the atmosphere as well um and those meetings are tend to be more like intermediate um level I mean, it's obviously the experts. There's also the beginners. Um, and then you have local clubs, like city clubs, that uh, you have much lower levels. I mean, it's also part of it, how much effort it is to get to the event in question. Because if you generally, the more you effort you put into Esperanto, the more you'd be willing to like buy the international flight to Montreal, for example. Um, but yeah, it really depends on the kind of event. And um, the smaller events tend to have... Uh, lower levels but it's also more informal much more chill mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it really just depends what you're after okay really yeah i remember going to meetup events when i lived in abu dhabi mm -hmm. and we would do you know an arabic meetup night or something like that and we'd go in and you might only speak 50 words of arabic mm -hmm. or 100 words mm -hmm. of arabic but mm -hmm. that was okay like i mean you could start from basically mm -hmm. nothing and you know, use that as a way to start learning a few more words or here or there. It was never an expectation that everybody who was going to be going was going to be mm. at a really high level because for that, you just go anywhere in the street or, or talk to anybody. There's so many resources, mm. but for the beginning type of people, you know, um, smaller local, you know, we used meetup, but um, any of those types of platforms, I think probably makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I went to meet up German meetups in New York city. And I remember that kind of atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It's nice. I also recommend it. If you're learning a language, go to 
See if there's a meetup in your city. <laughs> Definitely. So if someone's listening to this and they go, all right, I, I want to give this a try. What is like an expectation, like a reality um, for time frame? Like if they dedicate themselves to this, you know, what can they expect? Oh, it really matters. Um, well, a lot of it too is your background. If you, I've seen like the crazy polyglot come in with, he speaks 15 languages already. And by the third day, they're like speaking like almost intermediate level. And you're just like, what what is happening here? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it really depends on what you're coming in with. And, um, uh, so, I mean, it took me about, I'd say about a half hour a day. And, but I also, okay, anyway, I'll just, I'll just say a half hour a day. I was started learning it in 2001. And about a year later, I felt conversational with it. Um, and two years later, I felt like fluent, basically. Um, I mean, obviously, if you go to events, that greatly accelerates because then you're thrown into an Esperanto environment. And there's actually there's events all over the world. There's a event a servo, which will show you um, Esperanto events happening. You can even filter it by city or by multi-day event. And there's online events. So you don't want to okay. travel. You just want to go to a Zoom. I mean, this, this popped up more during COVID. And mm -hmm, I kept mm -hmm. a lot of those running still. So if you want to just attend a meeting, I think the group in Chicago still meets online, for example. And, and obviously, whatever destination interests you, you could see if there's events there online. Um, um, but I, I find that now with resources, much better. Because, I mean, you can go to italki now. It didn't exist in 2001 when I started learning. There's Duolingo now. There's Lerno.net. Um, there's all these apps. Um, it's greatly accelerated it where um, I... I, it's more than once I've heard, like I started learning Esperanto a month or two months ago and, and they're just like, sorry for the mistakes. They're not making any mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> like what's going on? <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's obviously how much effort you put in. I mean, if you're putting in an hour a day, that's going to give you much different results than five minutes a day on an app. Sure. Um, yeah, maybe get an idea now. Um, yeah, if you're an intense polyglot and go for an intensive weekend, maybe a weekend is enough to get up to a decent level. And if you just do five minutes a day and you you suck at languages, then you know, a couple of years, but maybe that's a fun tool. I mean, they say that um, it's good at uh, um, um, it's, um, not having Alzheimer's when you uh, get older by mm -hmm, learning mm -hmm. languages. It's one of the most intense like memory exercises you can do. So um, even for that, it's useful. Even if you, as I know people who don't even want to learn Esperanto and they, um, they'll learn Esperanto for like two weeks just to um, get, just to learn how to learn a language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in, even in two weeks, you can start having like experiencing language learning already. So. Well, I remember when I was doing some research on language learning and, and I'm going to totally brutalize these numbers. So don't call <laughs> me out if I, if I get them wrong, everyone, but um it was if you were coming from an English, if you were a native English speaker and you were coming to another language, how many hours of, of study? And I, and I mean, like real study, not just mm -hmm. BS, but I think for most of the Romance languages, so Portuguese, Italian, French, Spanish, these types of languages and Romanian was 400 hours. And for German, mm -hmm. so that would be considered a level one language. And for German was like a level two language. It was like 550 hours or 600 hours and it went all the way up to a level five language, which was like um, Chinese, Japanese, Korean and Arabic, which were two and a half thousand hours. So it kind of mm -hmm. gives you, you know, a bit of a basis when you're going into a language, how many hours and really how many months or how many years you're going to have to dedicate where you're going to really become fluid. So mm -hmm. with that kind of in mind, you know, in your guesstimate, where would Esperanto fit in? Well, I'd say like if you compare it for English speakers learning uh, French, German or Spanish, those are the most typical language, I'd say probably like five times faster is my guess. Okay. Just because they just because the regularities just make it easy to, I mean, you don't have to learn all those stupid <laughs> rules that don't make any sense. They don't contribute to communication. Because I remember speaking with a uh, as a, a Brazilian, and uh, actually he was randomly in the wrong bed in the hostel I was staying at. <laughs> but then uh, I found out that um, and we tried to communicate, and he said, "I don't speak English," and we communicate through Spanish, and I was like. And I was thinking about it later, and I was like, this is not neither of our native languages. And this is stupid that we have to still wrap our tongues around all these irregularities when they don't contribute to us communicating at all. Mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah, I've had that experience um, too when traveling with my wife. We'll try to talk some to someone, and it's like, do you speak English? No. Spanish? No. Korean? <laughs> no. Chinese? No. Uh, my daughter's learning Russian now as well. So, you know, mm. now we'll be able to add that one. And, you know, at one point, I'm hoping that we'll be able to pretty much communicate with anybody on the earth uh, in one of the languages we, we speak as a family. But, uh, mm it's kind of funny when you have to kind of start listing through languages uh, <laughs> to try to find one. So, so you oh, said probably... say, um, what, one more thing I want to say quick. Um, I remember um, meeting a big guy from Beijing online and it was funny because he told me he learned, um, he spent seven years learning English and a year learning Esperanto and he could already speak Esperanto better than English. And this Amazing. is from a Chinese person. So I was just like, wow, that's crazy. And another study just to quickly, um, um, just talk about how effective Esperanto is learning is um, there was a group that learned um, Esperanto for a year and uh, French for three years and another group that learned French for four years and the group that learned Esperanto first actually spoke French better than the group that learned French because they were really like they were more at the sense of like trying to analyze the language like really getting at the, the points like um, so where is this word coming from and where does it fit into the sentence and it's really fascinating definitely well it's so wild okay i mean i have a long history with spanish but um when i first started trying to learn it and looking at how many conjugations there are and then the tenses mm. and then conjugating things in mm. different tenses <laughs> and it's like there can be one word and there's like 47 different spellings or something for <laughs> this you know one depending on and then there's the masculine feminine and it's like this is insane. So mm -hmm. what I'm guessing with Esperanto is they've simplified and taken out a lot of this stuff because you had mm -hmm. said the conjugation, but what about masculine feminine and what about tenses? Um, those types of things. Yes. Yeah. So there's no, um, well, there's just uh, either law or you, you drop it. So if it's like a or an, you just drop the article. And if it's the, then you put law. Super simple. Um, yeah. Like, the verbs don't change based on who's saying it. So it's me amas, vi amas, she amas, li amas. So I love, you love, she loves, mm -hmm. he loves. Um, yeah, so many things like that. Just what seems like the natural, what's natural, which is funny because um, so I was in the parliament building in uh, Strasbourg and uh, and I was, and the lady asked me like, who are you representing? And I said, oh, the world Esperanto youth organization. Oh, that artificial language, like, uh, okay, <laughs> it's a great way to treat the people you. Okay, anyway. <laughs> um, but my my thought then afterwards was like, wait a minute, what what's actually more natural that I'm speaking Esperanto with someone else who also learned Esperanto, who doesn't share a native language with me, or that I'm speaking into a microphone and I'm wearing headphones and someone in a booth across the room is trying to interpret what I'm saying and some to someone else who's wearing headphones. And who's going to speak back in a mic to me? I was like, which is the natural way to communicate here? Like, it just really, yeah, made me think about things a bit. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Well, so, and to circle back to your other point, you said that probably fa five times faster. So if mm -hmm. we use the same study that I had read at, I think it was 400, but let's say it was 500. Mm -hmm. So that would mean in 100 hours mm -hmm. of intense study, you should be pretty far along in the language and be able to have conversations and um, do a lot of things. Now, when we compare that to how long it takes people to study in traditional school and your story about mm -hmm. seven years of studying English, seven mm -hmm. years, <laughs> and they could, still couldn't speak it at a really high level and came in with a new language and blew it out of the park. Um, yep. It's very interesting. I think it's very interesting. Thank you. I think, I think it's fascinating too. Like the things I just hear, like, I mean, even just the strange psychological effects, the first Esperanto event, actually the first uh, Universal Congresso was in France in uh, 1905. And um, people came from say, Russia, France, Germany, England, Switzerland. And they found by the end of the week, they sort of developed this neutral accent. And it's just it's completely fascinating to think that everyone's coming together it's because artificial language and then by the end they've sort of just speak in a neutral accent together and there's just these things that i wish linguistics would study more about esperanto it's just fascinating to me definitely now 
I want to talk a little bit about the families. Have there ever been mm -hmm. any families that are teaching their children Esperanto as a first language? There are. And I mean, if you think about it, say you have a, um, a couple that um, uh, met from a Japanese woman meets with a, a German man, for example, in an Esperanto meeting, and then they don't have any common language between them. Um, so, but the funny thing is what um, really people who tend to want to have native kids will, um, will be active to which, and they decide that one of them will speak Esperanto because the, the, the other thing that people think about, say you have this, this family again, like say the Japanese mother and the um, German father is they, the, the usually people think, you know, the father thinks I'm going to speak German with my kids. And the mom thinks I'm going to speak Japanese with my kids. The thing is, Esperanto is so easy to learn, they can just pick it up later in life as a second language. It's no big deal. So typically what you're getting is people who speak the same language, but they know through know each other through Esperanto and they're like, we want to give our kid a richer language experience or, or even more practically, they want to go to Esperanto family events. They don't want their kid to be left out because they can't speak Esperanto. Um, there's Those are the families who are more typically raising Esperanto kids. Um, oh, I, actually, if you want to delve into this more or your listeners want to delve into this more, there's a, a video on YouTube called Esperanto Like a Native. It's a bit of a pun there, like a native. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have interviews with uh, five or six uh, Esperanto, um, uh, native Esperanto speakers, and you can hear their experience um, growing up with it and things like that. It's Amazing. Fascinating. <laughs> so we're coming up on our hour. What would be, mm -hmm. you know, last advice or tips or tricks or anything that you would give people who say, yes, this is something that I want to learn more about? And don't so just send them say, to the app as well, because you've done that <laughs> twice. <laughs> well, I'd say, um, well, think about, um, you probably learned another language before. Think about what you really want to, like your method of learning languages, what works for you. I mean, I heard a um, uh, famous polyglot, uh, Judith Meyer says the, the best language, the best method for learning languages is the method that you use. So I'd say, find what you use, but make it fun. Like, don't, I mean, it's Esperanto, come on. You don't need to cram it down your throat. Um, or find an Esperanto event near you when you, um, like, just have goals, maybe. What you want to do with it? Do you want to travel with it? Do you want to host people? Some people, I know a guy in Manhattan, he just says, I don't like traveling, but I host the world in my my home. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, think of what you want to do with Esperanto and uh, then find learning resources that will help you reach your goals. Amazing. Really fascinating topic. You know, I think it's so interesting as we're out there building communities and looking at how in humans interact with each other. It's just so cool to learn about something like this, which really I know pretty much nothing going into the conversation. So a lot of it is very, very mm. new for me. So Chuck, thank you so much for your time today. If my listeners want to get a hold of you, if they want to find more about your work, where can we send them? So I recommend going to amikumo.com. That's our app. Also, if you're nearby, I'll pop up in the app next to you. Um, if you want to reach me by email, you can reach me at chuck at amikumu.com. Maybe you should spell that for us as well. So everybody listening to the show will have reference to it. That's A-M-I-K-U-M-U. -M -M Amazing. Chuck, thank you so much. And I will talk to you soon. Okay, thank you.